If you have the ability to love, love yourself first. Charles Bukowski. The super elites are about to flip the system upside down. Keep your friends and family aware. Like, subscribe, share these videos. But by and large, I think that this technological development uh, is defining a new era. Augustin Karstens, the general manager of the Bank of International Settlements, a very conservative individual, just stated that this new technological development is defining the new era. That the change to unbundled business models is to some extent inevitable. As the board would say on Star Trek, resistance is futile. And I'm here to say that change may be good because the transformation is giving us more choice to assemble a portfolio of products and services that meet our unique lifestyles and that can evolve more easily as our life needs change. What we have to do, however, is to have a federal banking system that supports that and doesn't resist it. Now, the second change I mentioned earlier is the decentralization of finance, or DeFi, powered by blockchains and other distributed ledger technologies, the rocket fuel for which is crypto. Now, this is no small change. It could be tectonic in scale. Blockchain technology is to the financial system what the internet was to libraries and post offices. Regulators and incumbent service providers, all of them, need to get ahead of this or be relegated to economic history. The change is real. It may have taken a little bit more time than we thought, but it's now here and it's large. About 60 million Americans own some form of cryptocurrency and more than a quarter of institutional investors hold crypto assets in their portfolio. He used the term tectonic. A tectonic shift is when the Earth's plates move. He compared crypto assets to the plates of the Earth shifting. Big banks are being broken up, depackaging and debundling all of the services that tier one banks have. Fintechs are able to efficiently replace the services that they offer. More than a quarter of institutional investors hold crypto assets in their portfolio. As debt maxes out, the uncertainty rises in the global economy. This number will continue to rise. The quarter of institutional investors will continue to add. We could transform the cost and convenience of payments, which is a still undisrupted part of the financial services economy, particularly credit cards, but also remittances, foreign exchange transactions, those sorts of things. Uh, what James has done together with Travis is really extend my understanding, first of all, that this technology can address anything of value, not just the conventional payments world. And second, that it actually points in the direction of a brand new computing paradigm, which is really transformative. Debts and IOUs are being reset to tokens. This system is going to transform everything of value into tokens, the tokenization of everything. This network of tokenized assets that will live on the internet is the internet of value. We want to move money the way information moves today. This paradigm shift is going to be tectonic. It's going to be a new era. It is an absolute travesty that our country is a decade behind the United Kingdom and Mexico with regard to real-time payments. It is disappointing that we're optimistically promised a system <clears throat> in 2024. Let me say again, 2024 for faster payments in the United States. I don't want to wait four years for that, and I'm sure neither do you. I'm not sure our international competitiveness can wait. He's talking about the FedNow service. Real-time payments are not behind. The clearinghouse is owned by a consortia of banks and works in parallel to the Fed. It offers a real-time payments platform. When push comes to shove and we need to compete, quote, with our international competitiveness can wait, end quote, the private sector is ready with the clearinghouse's real-time payments platform. As a side note, the Clearinghouse's software is a Finastra product, and Finastra is a RippleNet partner. That gives their customers the option to settle with on-demand liquidity. Today, payments have, to the vast majority, over 99.9% .9 of pay payments, electronic payments, are done under the rails of where eventually the central bank is involved. So I think that the fact that we have been innovating the proof it is there. The central banks have been innovating. We haven't made a big splash like Bitcoin, like Libra, like Big Tech, but we are there. The fact that payments depend today on central bank rails is, is, is again 
the most important tribute to that. Augustine just told you that the central banks are here. The central banks have allowed this technology to progress. Every time you hear about a proof of concept or a bank utilizing blockchain, they need approval from the central bank. He said just because they haven't made a splash like Bitcoin or Libra, meaning they're working on it behind closed doors. This is happening. It's just not out in the open. But the, the, I think later on, what we will see is this new form of computing, which is decentralized, will eliminate the need for large hierarchical institutions like big banks to be the owners of the truth about who owns what. And as a consequence of which, that takes a massive amount of cost out of the system uh, and um, revolutionizes the cost basis of finance. And that'll challenge the business model of some of the largest institutions. That could take time, but don't forget, in technology, we always overestimate what can happen in a year and underestimate what can happen in a decade. Fintech has the ability to offer services some of the largest money center banks on the planet offer for a fraction of the cost. The big banks are either going to adopt this technology or be replaced. They can slow it, but it's happening and the proof is all around us. Now, blockchain also can make mundane, tedious processes much more efficient and dramatically cheaper. For instance, right now, there are companies originating mortgages entirely on the blockchain and are reducing costs by one or two percentage points on every loan. Now, what may surprise some people is how much of this DeFi and crypto revolution is already occurring inside the federal banking system. Interest rates are at near zero. Blockchain has the ability to lower mortgages by one or two percentage points. This means that technology can breathe life into the housing market. When they offer this at scale, the reaction to a crisis is this tech. Uh, if, if, if you, we start from the point of view that one of the greatest inventions in humanity has been the creation of fiat currency, uh, the natural evolution is to uh, provide that fiat currency in a technologically more adequate way. Listen to Augustine praising fiat currency. Throughout history, all fiat has gone to zero. Central bank digital currencies is a way for them to switch from IOUs to credit and extend the lifespan. Even with extending it, the end is near. Tokenization of real value on a network. The network has the ability to atomically swap assets and the fiat on the network is central bank digital currencies. That a global cyber uh, crisis would be a, a serious risk and, and particularly the potential scale and speed at which such an event uh, could unfold. They keep foreshadowing a cyber crisis. This is code for a cyber crisis is coming. The reckless monetary policy and physical policy is coming to an end. When they know it's going to hit the fan, they're simply going to shut down the system and blame it on a group of cyber criminals. So the, we're, we're in a, you know, you saw the China economy starting to grow again. We're in a very bad place uh, with respect to how we manage the pandemic and the economic consequences of that are manifest and they're gonna be long-term and they need to be addressed. They're never going to be accountable. The issues will never be addressed. They're going to have scapegoats and then they will move to a new system. A cyber resiliency, as we depend more and more on systems, uh, the issue of cyber res resiliency is important. It's not, not only cyber security from the point of view of being able to defend or against hackers or malware, but also is a dependency on, let's say, the electricity grid uh, and uh, about the other aspects that ca can come in the way of uh, facilitating a smooth uh, application of uh, an implementation of technology. Uh, our, our degree of alertness high and to invest a lot on uh, cyber resiliency because this is a, this is a field where uh, we cannot uh, afford uh, mistakes or accidents. I mean, it's, it's an area where we need to assure that uh, payment and other applications of technology is a 100% uh, uh, proof. Michael Sheratov, Klaus Schwab, and now Augustine Karsten speak about an attack on the energy grid. When the lights go out, I will know what happened. The new system will be on the other side.
The large custody banks, State Street, Goldman Sachs, and JP Morgan, for example, hold billions of dollars in deposits backing crypto assets such as stablecoins. Banks are exploring their own blockchains to power payments and back office operations internally. Visa is exploring support for stablecoins affirmatively and aggressively. Stablecoins obviously being cryptocurrencies that are backed by an asset such as a fiat currency and are designed to have a stable value. And some fintech companies outside of this space have now decided they actually want to be banks or to buy banks or to partner with banks. And why? Because as Willie Sutton said, that's where the money is. Pairing stable coins to digital assets is a million times easier than pairing Fedwire to digital assets. This is a huge leap for the internet of value. Some fintechs, Ripple for example, has announced lending and bought MoneyGram. There is a strategy. It might not be clear from where we sit, but we will know why the pieces were positioned after Checkmate. And, and supervisory challenges to stable coins. And they state, for instance, that global stable coins are expected to adhere to all applicable regulatory standards before uh, they are allowed to commence operation and also to adapt to newly emerging regulatory requirements as necessary. And within the FSB, the authorities also agreed on the need to apply supervisory and oversight capabilities and practices under the principle, same business, same risk, same rules. Uh, in, in some jurisdictions that will imply that global stable coins may not fit within the existing regulatory and supervisory uh, frameworks. But in that case, then it's clear that existing regulatory and supervisory frameworks may need clarification. Uh, they may, may need adjustment or even new regulations. The hypothetical global stable coin that the G20 announced was the impetus for nations to get their regulations in order for digital assets. The same is true with DeFi and crypto. We can either adjust our regulatory perspective and ensure that activity can occur safely and fairly within the federal banking system, or it's going to take place, it'll just take place outside the banks. We will not stop continental drift by ignoring it. Ignoring this is not an option. The global stablecoin is confirmation digital assets are here to stay. An intellectual says a simple thing in a hard way. An artist says a hard thing in a simple way. Charles Bukowski. Thank you for liking and subscribing. If you enjoy my work, please consider joining my Patreon. If you think the system can be saved, iTrust Capital offers IRAs and cryptocurrencies and precious metals. There are real tax incentives for owning IRAs. The link is in the description below.